Now, if you were listening yesterday, um, you heard my interview, a, an exclusive interview with a businessman, a New Zealand businessman, who was arrested and held in prison for 46 days in Iran um, and went through hell to get out and yesterday told his story um, about his experience with Iran and what is happening. And also we have had the story of the two bonehead social media influencers who went there against government advice, um, got held under house arrest by the Iranians and were essentially held to ransom in return for New Zealand being very mild about what is going on in Iran, and one presumes some money changing hands from these rich idiots' parents, um, they were released. Since they're released, our government has grown a pair on the issue of the social unrest, if not revolution, that is occurring in Iran, and we seem to have got on board with the rest of the world, which is taking this as a serious issue. But where do we go next? And how far should we go to stand up for the rights of those who are pre oppressed in Iran? To get some, some context, uh, to get some expert advice on this, we're joined by um, um, political commentator and international relations uh, expert, Jeffrey Miller. Uh, Jeffrey, how are you? Nice to have you back with us. I'm well, Sean. Good morning. All right, wasn't that a mess up with the social media influences? Wasn't that just a complete cluster F? Well, it certainly explained things because I was mystified like many others why New Zealand was so reluctant to really talk about the Iran situation. And, you know, suddenly this came out last week and I thought, oh, it all makes sense now. There was actually, there was a meeting between the Naima Huta and the Iranian foreign minister in about the middle of September. It was just before Masa Amini was, uh, was killed. And I thought this was very odd because it was only released on the Iranian foreign minister's website. Uh, there was no mention of it by uh, our foreign ministry or uh, the Naya Mahuta. Or our media and, who uh, had bought into the kind yeah. of silence well, of the government. I think there were some other media, some media outlets who found this as well, like I did, and they asked questions of MFAT and then they were told to shut up basically because they were working behind the scenes to try and free these, uh, these two idiots. Instagram The two idiots, people, Instagram you know? idiots, yeah. What should we do so, now then? Yeah, it all makes yeah. sense. What do we do now then, Jeffrey, that those idiots are presumably off taking selfies somewhere else? What should our stand be on Iran? And in practical terms, what influence can we possibly hope to have on, on the events unfolding there? Well, the government's certainly become a lot more vocal. We had uh, we've had about four we had about four tweets from Nanaya Mahuta last week suddenly about Iran after these two uh, individuals were, were freed. So I think it does make a mockery of the idea that the government wasn't going soft. I mean, that was their line. They said, "Oh, we we weren't going soft." I think it was clear that they were. We also saw a parliamentary motion condemning the violence. Um, we saw though this week the suspension of a, a bilateral human rights dialogue between New Zealand and Iran. I mean, you would take that as a given that you would suspend something like that, given what's going on. Um, beyond that, it's it's hard to see exactly what New Zealand uh, could do. We remember we don't have a general autonomous sanctions regime. There's a bespoke regime that was introduced to penalise Russia uh, earlier in the year, the Russia Sanctions Act. But there is no general autonomous sanctions regime. Uh, the Naimahuta has said that we may be able to use the Russia Sanctions Act to to punish Iran because there is a provision there if you're helping Russia in the war that you can be penalised as well. But that would only be in relation to really Iran's support of the war in Ukraine, not generally. So I don't know where the government will go to from here. Um, I don't see them really introducing a whole new sanctions act to punish Iran. And I'm not sure really what much difference it would make. I mean, Iran is one of the most sanctioned countries in the world. And while we don't have sanctions on them, a lot of countries do, like the United States. And there are secondary impacts. If you trade with Iran and you do you dealings with Iran, uh, you'll get punished by the US. So that's why you know there's very minimal trade between New Zealand and Iran at the moment. And remember, it was one of our big trading partners. You go back to the 1980s. Iran was yeah. Oh, yeah, huge. Sport, I know. I can remember a no, no number of people who went on, on trade, trade missions there. Yeah, we were into it like yeah, Robert's and that's why. And that's why we've still got an embassy there in Tehran. We have had since 1975, from the time of the Shah right through the revolution to the present day, uh, is because it could be a very lucrative market if the political situation allowed for it. But right now, it certainly doesn't. Mm. 
What is happening, do you think, in Iran right now? Um, Rob McGregor, who we spoke to yesterday, the businessman who had gone through this hell, 46 days in a prison and having to pay $300,000 to get out um, and then fled the country back to New Zealand. Um, what is happening? Is there a revolution on there or will the power of that authoritarian, um, religious authoritarian state in the end crush um, the encouraging signs of resistance that we see? Well, this uprising, it just continues. I mean, we were almost two months into it now and there's no sh sign that it's abating. And in previous waves of protests, you go back to 2009 after the disputed elections there, for example, there have been other instances of uh, of protests in Iran over the years. You know, they've tended to be crushed or dwindled by this point, but this time they haven't. So we're almost two months in and there's just so much frustration in Iran. Of course, you know, these protests were nominally caused by the killing of that, of that woman, Masa Amini, but I think there's just a lot of pent up frustration. The economic situation is just dire. The youth unemployment is ridiculously high. The economic situation is terrible. And that is because of the years of sanctions that the country's been under. So, you know, it remains to be seen whether this becomes a full throated revolution. Iran still hasn't really used the Revolutionary Guard. This is a parallel force that they have that was set up by Ayatollah Khamenei to to uh, to protect the revolution. And if that really gets used, you know, I mean, it could be quite a bloody uh, repression of, of this dissent. But that really hasn't happened yet, although they've threatened to, to use that those forces. Do you um, believe, okay, so you're saying there's not much more in practical terms that we can do as a nation in regards to well, this? Well, I mean, there are always things that you could do. I mean, you could kick out the ambassador here. You could withdraw our ambassador from there, from Tehran. But would it actually change what's happening? I, I really have my doubts about that. I think it would be much better to keep the diplomats in place. And at least it gives us some eyes and ears in Iran. Remember, it's quite hard to get information out of Iran. Um, you know, the, the internet is very heavily censored. And uh, having a diplomatic mission there is actually quite useful uh, in terms of of, of finding out what's happening. And in case we need the diplomats, I mean, we saw how we we needed those diplomats to get these two New Zealanders out. Um, you know, there might be something else in the future that we need a, a, a diplomats for. So I would always go for the engagement route, but rather than the, you know, uh, you know, the expulsion route, but you you could argue that. I mean, it's been argued, of course, with the Russia case, you know, what use does it do New Zealand to have uh, a Russian ambassador in Wellington or a Iranian ambassador in Wellington? You might make you feel good to kick them out, but I would say it doesn't, wouldn't change anything. Would it actually help the people of Iran? I, I wouldn't say in a, in a huge way. Uh, Jeffrey, in, in a discussion with this businessman, Ron McGregor, yesterday too, we, we discussed if there are any parallels or how we compare, I don't know, our emotional engagement with the war in Ukraine with what is happening in Iran. They both involve people um, being repressed or facing in injustice. Um, I guess a shooting war is more dramatic and uh, engages us more than an internal revolution by, by people who just want some basic freedoms. Is it just as it's important as Ukraine or not? Well, I mean, I guess the war in Ukraine involves a great power or former great power, Russia invading its neighbour. It is perhaps inherently more uh, dramatic. Um, it's had huge impacts on you know, things like inflation, uh, fuel prices. I don't know whether you can say the same about the, the Iranian conflict. It is a more of a civil conflict and we tend to be less interested in civil conflicts. You look at what's happening in Ethiopia, uh, for example, or you look at the repression in Belarus after the elections uh, a couple of years ago, that didn't get a huge amount of attention either here in New Zealand. I guess there's only so much attention to go around. Uh, the government itself is you know, not hugely keen on getting involved in in all kinds of foreign affairs issues. They want to be quite focused on the Pacific. I think they've been pushed here with Iran. I think Gora's government has actually done quite an effective job here in getting this on the agenda. There've been others as well, David Seymour, um, mm. and you know, quite a number of activists as well in the Iranian community who have actually forced the government's hand here and, and good on them. Um, you know, that's what public pressure can do. Um, but well, yeah, freedom I guess- Freedom of speech so many... does, Jeffrey. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, <laughs> You know, this has got the government responding now. And finally, now that these two have been freed, the Instagram uh, couple, uh, they don't really, government doesn't really have any excuses and they're under a lot of political pressure to, to speak out a bit more strongly. And that's what they're doing at the moment. Any predictions, Jeffrey, as how do you think 
things might go there? In Iran? Mm. Um, I mean, how can you predict? I, You know, you could just see a, a real bloody crushing of, of dissent and, you know, maybe at some point the protesters just simply lose the, the will to keep going. And, uh, you know, when you've got this revolutionary guard force of you know, several hundred thousand, you know, elite Iranian troops, I mean, they could uh, really... Uh, they could really launch a quite a, a bloody crackdown here. Um, alternatively, you know, that might just in, inspire it to all keep going, but it, it really is anyone's guess of which way. I think it is quite a pivotal moment this month and things really could spiral quite quickly. And we could see, a, you know, another Iranian revolution or civil, or civil war. I think that could have huge, you know, huge implications. I think in these situations, you always have to be careful what you wish for. It could end up a lot worse than it is now. But, uh, you, know, it, you know, it's such a bleak and dire situation. It has been for years in Iran with the, you know, the economic situation and the repression of dissent there. It's, it's a pretty terrible uh, situation to be in for the Iranian people. Jeffrey, I thank you so much indeed for your insight and taking the time to talk to us uh, as always, and I hope we talk again soon. That is uh, international uh, political commentator, international relations expert uh, Jeffrey Miller on the situation in Iran. What a bumper show this morning, to be honest. You're on the platform.